I have arrived above the planet where the corpse worshippers are looking for Archaeotech. They are located in a box canyon that appears to have hosted military training. The scans show plenty of rocks and foliage to conceal our approach. I will be moving in shortly to secure whatever it is these fools have uncovered. Welcome back to the Forge of Sagas. In today's video, we're going to be conquering another essential part of any outdoor battlefield, rocks and trees. These terrain features can provide great cover and concealment for your units as they move across the battlefield. So without further ado, let's get started. To get started, we're going to take some dollar store bricks of florist foam to make the base for our rocks. We're just going to take a hot wire cutter and attack that in just a couple of random ways, just trying to slice out some rocky patterns in it. You don't have to be very precise with this. You could do this with a handheld cutter or a knife if you wanted to as well, but I got this new hot wire table for my birthday and I wanted to try it out, and this is just a great project for learning how to use your tools. I cut one of the blocks in half just to give me some variety of height so I could have some taller rocks, some shorter rocks, and this is going to help us when we put everything together in a minute. But the process is the same, you're just going to go in and hack away at the edges with your hot wire tool or your knife. And think about creating different sizes too. We've not only cut it down in height, but we can also make smaller rocks that's going to give us more variety that you would see in natural formations. You can also cut these foam blocks vertically if you want to have more height to your piece. Line of sight blocking terrain is always important in wargaming, and this additional height might allow you to hide taller models like monsters or vehicles instead of just infantry. Once you have a couple of different pieces, you can start playing around with seeing how they fit together. It's kind of a jigsaw puzzle except that, you know, who knows how it actually goes together. You just have to make it look good for you. So once you've decided that you like a shape, I like to make just a little bit of a base out of chipboard. It's A, a good way to use my scraps, and B, it's going to provide just a little bit more stability for some of the narrower pieces that we're making. And then once I've decided the shape, I just take my hot glue gun on its low temperature setting because the high temperature setting will start to melt the foam and it won't adhere correctly, and just glue everything in place. You can also cut a larger chipboard base and glue on several rocks to show an area where infantry models might be able to take cover. Here you can see I've used a couple of different varieties of foam, a lot of scraps from different projects to make a little outcropping and some other rocks that are just scattered around. And then I took five intercessors and kind of moved them around just to see where models would naturally fit. That way when I glue the rocks down, models can actually be placed on the terrain. Again, going back to our terrain principles, we want to make sure the terrain is interactive. If we add too many rocks, Models aren't going to be able to be placed flat, and that's going to lead to wobbly model syndrome. Things are going to fall over. It's just not going to be good. So just make sure you've got some models on hand in order to test your terrain and make sure that it's going to be playable as well as look good. Speaking of reusing scrap, I grabbed these two pieces that were left over from the demonic smelter kit. They came from where I cut out the hole for the skull. And I decided to glue them together to give me this nice elevated position of a rocky outcropping where, you know, maybe a sniper team might like to lurk or something else. Here I'm using Gorilla Glue Construction Adhesive because this stuff glues things down really nicely. It's a great bond. Really good stuff. So just make sure you get a goodly amount of that in there and then sandwich the two pieces together. Then once the glue is dry, it's back to the hot wire table to slice it up and give it that nice rocky texture. I wanted to connect the top of my outcropping to the ground via a walkway, so I needed something for the other end of that walkway to connect to. Therefore, I cut another little piece of rock out of this white styrofoam disc that I also got at the dollar store. It's slightly harder than the floral foam that I was using before, but you know, still cut well, came out in a nice shape. To make the walkway, I used the Wylox Armory method of creating a sandwich between two pieces of chipboard and a piece of cross-stitch mesh. I will link his video in the description where he talks about how to do this in detail and create a really great terrain set, but for me I just needed to run the gap between these two little pieces. Once I had it made, I traced out the area where I wanted to embed it into the rock with a sharpie, and then came in and cut it out with my knife. Remember to dry fit occasionally as you're doing the cut just to make sure that you get a nice flush fit between the chipboard walkway and your two stone pieces. When you're finished, it should look like this, nice and flush and at a good angle so that models don't fall over too easily. Secure it in place with some hot glue and we're ready to move on. 
The next step is just to give everything a healthy coating of Mod Podge just to give it protection against any paints, washes, or accelerant from primer that we introduce at later steps. The last step for our rocks is some gap filling with a little bit of spackle. I mix some brown paint into mine so that way should it ever chip in the future it'll have a color that isn't that stark white, lessons learned from previous adventures. And I just made sure that I spread that out all around the base to really blend these rocks into the base as well as fill any gaps that there were between the rocks when I glued them together. Before we get into painting though, we're going to make the stands for our trees. I went with this white foam from the dollar store because it was a little bit thicker and since we're going to have these trees sticking up out of them, I wanted a little bit more of a denser base. But to make them is very simple. Just go through and cut them out exactly the same way we were doing it before. Make those nice little rocky shapes. Really just go to town, have fun. Once you think you've cut yourself enough bases to have a good variety of thicknesses, sizes, and shapes, it's time to grab some store-bought plastic trees and see how we can improve them to make our forest. For this build, I bought two $10 bags of trees off of Amazon, and then when they got here, I just grabbed one of my marines and started to compare them. That big one was a little sketchy, but some of the other trees actually looked quite nice, and some of the shorter ones I think will make good bushes going forward. But for those trees of questionable quality, well, we have a way to make them look a whole lot better. I like the height of this big tree, but I thought it was a little bit sparse, so I grabbed a smaller version of the same tree from the kit, trimmed it down so that I could add it as a branch, and then just kind of fiddled with it for a while to make sure that I had a good, natural looking fit for this tree. Once I'd finished trimming and was happy with my fit, I grabbed my hot glue gun, which I had switched back to the high temperature setting to give myself a little bit more working time with the glue, and I glued my smaller tree into place on my big tree to create one very big tree. I felt the greenery was still a little bit sparse for my taste though, so I grabbed this Brillo pad that I got at the dollar store, they come in a pack of five, they're great for this sort of thing and chopped it up into little pieces so that I could add some more bulk and volume to my tree. Once I thought I had enough pieces, I grabbed my hot glue gun and started to attach them to the tree in any places that I thought were a little too empty. You can do this to your taste, and I ended up adding a lot of them to bulk out this tree, but you know, it's a taste thing. I like my trees a little bit more full, if you know what I mean. Once I was finished, this is how it looked. It's definitely a fuller tree, but it definitely also looks like I stuck a bunch of sponge into a tree. So. In the next step, we'll have to fix that. Using an old brush, I dabbed on some PVA glue to anywhere where I had a thick concentration of the Brillo pad. This is going to allow us to affix a bunch of different flocking elements that are going to cover that up for us. Next, we're going to add some green clump foliage from the hobby store. This stuff is really amazing for making trees because it sticks to glue really well and it naturally bunches up by sticking to itself so you can get those natural clusters of leaves that you would expect to see in a normal tree. Keep adding the foliage until you've covered up all of the exposed Brillo pad and you're happy with the shape of your tree. Next, we're going to take a little bit of spray glue and just spray that all over the tree. This is gonna serve two purposes. First of which is gonna help adhere that clump foliage just a little bit better. And secondly, it can serve as a base for a little bit of green flocking that we'll add just to give the tree a little bit more variety of color and blend together those two different shades of green that we have between the base leaves and the clump foliage. Then once you're happy with your tree, you can take your styrofoam base and stick it right in there. I recommend using one of the bigger bases for a tree of this size just to make sure that it doesn't wobble or fall over. Some of the other trees, especially the pine trees, I thought looked nice as is, and with these bigger bases, you want to add more than one tree. So, grab as many as you like, or as few as you like, and continue sticking them into the styrofoam base until you're happy with how things look. If anything falls off from the other tree, just stick it back on there. We'll put on a layer of sealant when we're all done with everything. Some of the trees that I got were a little bit small for scale with reference to our space marine here. but. What is too small to be a tree is exactly the right height to be a bush. So I trimmed the stem down so that I still had enough to insert it into the styrofoam, but that it was short enough so that it would obviously be a bush, and I shoved it right in amid all the other trees that I'd added. And there you have it, a nice little grove of trees. You can add as many or as few trees to whatever base you have, just make sure that it fits the size of the base and gives it that dense feel. You're also going to want to create some smaller pieces that are just maybe one tree or a tree in a bush. 
These are going to be an important part of your terrain set for helping to show where areas of dense cover might be. We'll talk more about how to lay out this terrain on your tabletop in order to convey these types of rules at the end of the video. The only issue I came across with this dollar store foam was that it had a very weird texture on the surface after it had been cut. So to fix that, I just got some very watered down spackle and applied that smoothly over the entire piece. That way I could maintain the cuts that I'd made, but give it a little bit more of a uniform texture that would take paint better than the underlying styrofoam. I gave all the pieces a nice black prime because that's the spray paint that I had on hand. And then I came in and gave everything a base coat of burnt umber. The goal for this paint job is to capture the rock formations that we see in Blood Gulch Outpost, which in the more nicely rendered Anniversary Edition is this nice striated rock where we've got some oranges, some tans, a little bit of red undertone. So these are the paints that I used to accomplish that. I'll put a full list of all the colors down in the video description, but we're not going to go through me adding all of these layers. It's a very repetitive process, so we're just going to discuss the basic technique. Our first layer is going to be an overbrush of Heritage Brick Red. Overbrushing is essentially dry brushing, but you're keeping more paint on the brush, and you can see that I'm getting pretty good coverage. We're looking for about 80-85% coverage because we're not going to add a wash to this piece. Because of that, we want these darker two base layers to serve essentially as our inbuilt shadows. Next, we're going to come in with a heavy dry brush of burnt sienna. This is going to start bringing in those more orangey colors that we saw in the reference photo. Make sure you're not digging too deep into the cracks because we want to preserve some of those reds and oranges that we got from our burnt umber and heritage brick. After that, we're just going to keep introducing layers of dry brushing of our increasingly brighter and, you know, sometimes going back to our darker colors to create these striations. You're just going to want to keep going back and forth until you have something that looks like this. You can see there's a lot of very subtle differentiations in the shades that go throughout the piece, and this is why we're not using a wash. I tried it, and it completely blurred the thing together. It eliminated all of those little different colors, so don't do it. As for when you know that you're finished, just keep going with different layers until you're happy with the end result. The areas of the Blood Gulch map which have these little rocky outcroppings mostly have a little bit of sand around them as well as some grass, so I added a layer of this sand color to anywhere where I had exposed chipboard bases. Next I came in with a little bit of olive drab, and here I decided that I wanted to make some paths. These are the places where people have continually walked through and the grass and vegetation have been worn away, leaving only this sandy color. So, those places I left sandy, and the rest I filled in with my olive drab. Lastly, I came in with a little bit of foliage green and just stippled it in a couple of different places to break up the olive drab and add a little bit of variety to this piece. And the last thing to do is add some flocking. I used this sponge brush to apply the PVA glue because it helped me get into all the cracks and crevices around the different trees that I'd added. Another thing I want to note is that I added a little bit more of my brown flocking than I did my green flocking, because that helped me match a little bit more to the color scheme I had done. I also laid some PVA glue down on all the pathways I'd created on my larger terrain pieces to help secure some sand. Now, I somehow forgot to record myself actually putting on the sand, but you can see me applying the PVA glue, and you can see the sand in the bucket right there, so I'm sure you can figure out what happens next. After applying a layer of matte varnish in order to protect our terrain against wear and tear, we can check this project off the list. Speaking of that list, we've only got one more item on our skirmish level terrain board to build, and that's our vehicle. So leave a comment on the video telling me which vehicle from Red vs Blue you'd like me to build, be it Sheila, the Warthog, or anything else. However, we still have one thing left to discuss, and that's how I like to set up my trees on my battlefield in order to generate impactful terrain rules. Here I set up a small example using some of my Space Marines and two of my Chaos Knight War Dogs. You can see how I've set up my trees to form this triangle. In Warhammer 40,000's 9th edition, we have a rule called Dense Cover, which conveys a minus one to hit for shooting attacks when a unit fires through dense cover or at a unit that is within dense cover. 
This rule is designed to show areas where a clear line of sight can't be established, such as industrial walkways that might have lots of cables and other things hanging down from them, or, as in our case, really densely packed trees that would obscure a firing model's view of a model either on the other side or within the cover. However, if we actually packed in that many trees to make it look the way it's supposed to, we'd never actually get our models in there. So instead, we create this shape to show the area where there should be dense cover, leaving us plenty of space to actually put our models on the tabletop and take advantage of the cover. So for instance, let's say that my repulsor executioner wants to fire at the war dog that's at the lower right hand side of your screen. We can draw a clear line of sight between the firing model and the target without passing through the dense terrain, so the repulsor executioner won't suffer the minus one to hit. However, if the repulsor were to target the other war dog, it would just nick the edge of our area of dense terrain that we've established, so it would suffer the minus one to hit against the war dog at the top right hand side of the screen. The intercessors, on the other hand, would suffer no penalty when firing at either Helverin, as they are wholly within the terrain feature as laid out by this triangle shape that we generated. And so there you have it, a little bit of a tip on how you can put those trees to use to create areas where your models may not be gaining cover per se, but they can certainly be gaining a level of concealment. And with that discussion finished, I think that about wraps things up for this video. I hope that you're all finding these terrain essential videos helpful in creating your own terrain, and I hope you're all enjoying watching me create my own tribute to Blood Gulge Outpost number one and the Red vs. Blue crew. If either of those statements are true, please give us a like and subscribe to the channel to keep up to date not only on this series, but on all the other terrain building, kit bashing, and other future projects we might get up to here on the channel. I want to thank you all for watching, and I hope to see you again the next time we ignite the Forge of Sagas.